DiscerningHearts.com presents Building a Kingdom of Love Reflections with Monsignor John Essef Ordained a priest from the Diocese of Scranton, Pennsylvania, Monsignor Essef has served as a retreat director and confessor to Blessed Mother Teresa. He continues to offer direction and retreats internationally for the Sisters of the Missionaries of Charity. Monsignor Esif encountered St. Padre Pio, who would become a spiritual father to him. He has lived around the globe, including Lebanon, serving the pontifical missions there. It is a Catholic organization established by Blessed John Paul II to bring the good news to the world, especially to the poor. Monsignor Esif assisted the founders of the Institute for Priestly Formation and continues to serve as the spiritual director for the Institute. He also actively serves as a retreat leader and director to bishops, priests, sisters, seminarians, and other religious leaders. Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We join Monsignor Essif as he's beginning to read a passage from The Gift of Nothing by Patrick McDonald. What do you get, someone who has everything? And he kept thinking, and all of a sudden it struck him. Nothing. He would give Earl the gift of nothing. But in this world filled with so many somethings, where would he find nothing? Mooch often heard Frank say there was nothing on TV. But as far as Mooch could tell, there was almost something on TV. Blah, 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 blah. Mooch often heard Deuce and her friends say there was nothing to do. But as far as Mooch could tell, everybody was always doing something. Playing, kicking ball, something. Millie came home from the store and then said there was nothing to buy. So Mooch went shopping for nothing. And there was this on sale and that, cut, price cut down, Bye, 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 so much. Mooch looked up and down every aisle. He found many, many, many somethings. The latest this, the newest that. But as far as he could tell, nothing was not for sale. So Mooch went home and sat on his pillow and just stayed still as long as cats do and often and not looking for it, he found nothing. So he went and got a box and put nothing in it. Then Mooch thought, hmm, maybe Earl deserves more than this. So he got a bigger box. Now that's plenty of nothing. And so he wrapped up this box and took it to his friend carrying this huge box. For me, said Earl. Mooch, you didn't have to give me anything. Who told him, thought Mooch. Earl opened Mooch's gift. There's nothing here, said Earl. Yeah said Mooch, nothing but me and you. 
So Mooch and Earl just stayed still and enjoyed nothing. Now, how I love your nothing. When we give the gift to each other that is so precious and we consider it nothing. What I really believe, if we have this true humility, true humility, we could say what I have is nothing, but what God has given me has infinite possibilities. And so I value that, and I want to distribute that, and I want to give that, but always with awareness that it's him, and without him, I have nothing. And with him, I have all and everything. Uh, it, was a, it was a very valuable reflection for me uh, to think about how I, in, in true humility, if I see what I have is really nothing, but if I see what he has given me, then what do I have? I have a very grateful heart, uh, mm-hmm. deep, deep gratitude. And it gives you a glimpse, doesn't it, of what it must be like in the heart of the Trinity and what heaven must be like because it's just that, that one-on-one, somebody hearing and sharing and touching someone's heart. It's just so – the word intimate keeps coming back to me over and over again, and that's why I think people are craving for is that intimacy. The word itself, into me see, into me see, to see into me. There's a lot of healing that has to take place, but especially the wounds of the heart. There is such an ache in the hearts of so many, and yet they don't know where to go. I mean, even in parishes with priests, they're overwhelmed and they have aching. I mean, in a country that has so much something, like you were talking about, they're, I think they're aching for that nothing. What would I really believe I when I when I tried to find what was the deepest nothing that we think we have it, it was amazing I came down to the Eucharist the exposition of the Blessed Sacrament in the monstrance on an altar in a church there he is apparently the bread of life and unless we find and, and discover how he can see into me the intimacy that I can have in the quiet hour of uh, every day of Eucharistic adoration. Probably the, the reason why every single person in the world who is so hungry, so needy, so broken, that if we can't find that intimacy between Jesus and me, especially in this sacrament. Uh, What I'm afraid of in all my preaching is that of all that I have preached, the sacred heart, uh, the sacraments, baptism, whatever subject, it's the bread of life. It's the Eucharist, which seems most of all nothing. Maybe that's why pastors... And in many uh, guardians of the Eucharist have overlooked the power. If we could have every bishop mandate every parish to have, if we have all this brokenness, to have the Eucharist available and every church door opened, that how we would have so many who are so broken, and so needy. You see, if you can't find Jesus in the bread of life, you're not going to be able to find him in yourself, in your children, or in in one another. Unless I hear him say to me in that deepest intimacy, John, I love you, and I hear it, and I return it in me, then I really, I don't know what I have to give you. As the Father has loved me, 
so I have loved you. And unless I hear that in the deepest part of my being, I really can't believe how beautiful I am, because I can never discover that by myself, nor can I discover it in anyone else. That infinite love, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. And am I that lovable? And as I, as I receive it, and I experience it, and I know his love, then I can begin to see the value of Jesus in you and of the love that I now can give you. It's that with what measure I have been measured. And once I have received this, what I think has been the failure is the experience of each soul, each person receiving the divine love. And unless I have had that intimate experience of union with him. Now we can talk about communion, we can talk about the Eucharist, but unless the experience, it's really tasted that fire of divine love. That, that love that I have, he's saying, for me, for me then I, I really don't know the measure with which he has it for you. So that I can't love my husband with that love. And once I've tasted it, the power of that love to give 100% to my, my spouse and or my child who who is, is wayward and, and uh, arrogant and going through the teenage arrogance or going through rebellion, I experience on a daily basis the intimacy of his love. And even for an hour before the Blessed Sacrament, that, that promotion of the Eucharistic devotion so that if I can have that intimate hour with him, I can have that 23 hours with others. And I can be filled with the fire of that love. So what is it that, that has been failed to be communicated about the good news? Uh, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures these days, Jesus has been going over in, in the Mass, I am the bread of life. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood shall have life in him. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, you shall not have this life. And, and this, he goes over it and over it again. This is a hard saying, some fell away. But do we have examples, living models of those who have experienced that Eucharistic. The churches can be filled with Catholic parishioners, and I just experienced Mass with the Pope, and he ordained nine, nine priests in Rome at, at today's Mass. But do we experience that communion with Christ? That as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you, and I have expressed this love to you by coming into your heart with the divine fire of love, and with my Father's love, with my love, with an infinite love. When that does happen, so often, and the saints talk about this too, I mean, and you touch that divine love, I mean, you have to kind of go through a wall of fire, one that purifies and one that heals. But I think... Unless you're guided through that, whether it's a hand on the other side of that fire that helps pull you through it, most people touch that wall and they jump back because they're not led. They might encounter it, but because of a lack of maybe a time for that intimacy with another to help them through it. Do you know where I'm going with that, Monsignor? Yes, yes, I do. What, I, what I've heard in, in many souls is that when he comes at us with this infinite love, 
we almost see in it that it's going to be a total consummation of whatever my plans are or whatever way I want to live. And, and as he comes, what resists that fire? What wall is there? What's that hardened heart that will not open to that divine fire? It's that it's going to cost me my entire self. He so loves me that he wants all of me. He loves me to the depths of my being. And I'm always holding something back from him so that I'll only give him so much. And then I meet him. Many times it's, it's fear of, to- of being totally consumed by this. And it's love that is going to consume me. And my egoism or my self-centeredness says, if I give in to him, he's going to take me completely. Then there will be nothing of me left. And actually what we're resisting now is the everything. He wants to become my all. He has so designed my heart that my holding on to the nothing, and that's what I hold on to, this selfishness, this self-centeredness that I hold on to, and that I'm fear, I fear being consumed by him, is nothing. It's exactly what we began with, our discussion. Mm-hmm. What does he want from me? My nothing. My self-centeredness is really nothing. I give him my nothing, and he gives me all. Now, unless you've experienced that, unless you realize that the exchange that you give, see, my being, my total being, is from him. What does he want from me? Take, Lord, receive. Everything I have has come from you. I give it back to you. The, the, the person who is being loved is simply giving back to God what God has given me. There is nothing that I give him that I didn't receive. And so what I want to keep for myself, I keeping this for myself, this is what I receive from him. So I give it back to him. That's when this exchange becomes the divine fire. When I give him my nothing, then I receive his everything. I give the nothing for everything. That's exactly what happens to all the saints in heaven. Every saint in heaven that has learned that has learned that only God, only God, only in God, the experience of God is what brings about life. I am the way and the truth and the life. Other than that, when, when I don't die to self, I'm dead. The seed falling into the ground remains alone. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It can't go anywhere. Really, uh, it's not a, I don't believe from what I'm just saying to my, it's, seems uh, unless I do it, unless I surrender it, unless mm-hmm. I give it, I can't experience it. It's not an intellectual matter. It's a response in faith, isn't it? I mean, it's that he reveals himself and then we respond. I'm thinking of the woman in the scripture who touches the cloak of Jesus' garment because she wants to be healed and just even that act, so humble. I mean, she just, and he's, and she's not even expecting him to see her if she can just touch that garment. And yet he does respond. He does know. And that's an even greater gift than even the, the healing of the hemorrhaging that she's been experiencing for her 12 years is the fact that he is aware of her and acknowledges her and they share that intimacy. 
I mean, that's where the real healing comes in because this poor woman's been neglected and abused and, and has had all these problems. And he even noticed her in that touch. Keep, keep following that through. You see, many people don't see what you just said. When she was healed, she, it was still hidden. That is, mm-hmm. the relationship was hidden. She was healed, and he was the healer. Mm-hmm. But no one knew that. Why did he want that? Then she says, it, now she recognizes that she has been recognized in that scene. That's actually what mm-hmm. the scriptures say. He insists, who touched me? Because mm-hmm. he wants to bring out the relationship between himself as the healer and the healed. Mm-hmm. And then he tells her, this, this relationship is now recognized by the community. Mm-hmm. Your faith has healed you. He says, to no, it wasn't that somebody is pushing and shoving. It's power went out from me. That power went into her. When, mm-hmm. when Jesus is in the Eucharist and the power comes into me, I am healed by that power that is radiating. It's like uh, some people have compared the Eucharist to the radiation of uh, the nuclear power going into me. See, the, mm-hmm. the nuclear power enters into me. But the, trans, the transmission of that, the, the recognition of that, is then when I come healed and, and acknowledge that. I've now become filled with this power so that now I become a nuclear reactor. You know, what's extraordinary about that, too, is that a lot of people were touching him. A lot of people were bumping into him and touching his garment and doing that in that moment. And yet she was the one who believed and desired that interaction. I mean, to be able to be healed. She believed. So even the anonymous touch, I mean, a lot of people were touching him, but they didn't appreciate what she knew, you know, that if they were, if, if, if that whole crowd were touching him, in the same manner, they all too could have been healed. Exactly. And that what went into her can now go into them. Mm-hmm. He brings that out. The Eucharist will, will have that same effect. That how do we know someone is burning up or not caught on fire? Because that fire now comes out of me. The fire comes from the Eucharist into me and now... I can radiate that same fire. Well, I mean, and it goes back to what you were saying, too, about in the very beginning. It was nothing. But ultimately, what they shared was nothing, and that's the ultimate intimacy. Yes, yes. And so who do you see now in me? I see Jesus. And and the power of that transmission, uh, I believe, uh, more and more, is going to come from the Eucharist. I've been baptized, and many times the baptized person can lay as a burnout nuclear reactor that was never activated. And uh, the, uh, then I, I've been confirmed, but it's like a dead soldier. You know, there's nothing really going on because I won't die to self. But the Eucharist, mm-hmm. you pump the body and the blood into this dead cell. And it soon begins to awaken. And as the, as the dead cell becomes alive, then this body, the church, the, the Catholic church, first of all, is going to be, because we have the Eucharist, and this body will be plunged into uh, his body, his blood. And the Eucharist now becomes the, the force and the power to transform the church. The priest needs to be transformed. When his hands begin to be f- put on fire, like the fire of uh, Padre Pio, as the blood pours down from his hands and his heart and, and onto the, the floor of the world, the, the priest now can become that radiator. 
but it just doesn't happen because you hold the Eucharist in a ritual. It's mm-hmm. got to be that intimacy, that communion, where that intimate love takes place between the priest and the Lord. That sa- and that, that has to be total surrender. He then will live in me. Let me live in you, and, and you will live in me. Your life then is my life. I am the way and the truth. It's not going to change. And then the people to whom he gives the Eucharist, the Eucharistic ministers, the lectors, the, the children, the first communicants, the people who now they, they, each one in his or her heart, teenagers, parents, elderly, the sick and the suffering who, who receive the Eucharist then become. And, and I, I believe one of the greatest things that can happen to the entire church today is that we place the Eucharist on the altar and let Jesus radiate that for those who will come, those who, who he will draw and transform. Mm. So we get these nuclear reactors out of the church into the public to transform society. See, we, we, we are not transforming society. Society is transforming. When Catholics, like, they say 98%, I don't know if that's, that's what they say, of women are, are contracepting. Uh, well, what's going, what's going on um, if they're Catholic women who, and couples who are living this? What's happening? How do they and the Eucharist how, do, how does that life transmit? I am the way and the truth and the life. If this is what the teaching is, then it's not being transmitted through, and or, or if only 50%, whatever the figure might be. Mm-hmm. But I dare, I, I, I dare say that there's something when, you know, all these millions of abortions that are taking place, that Catholics have as many abortions as other people. Uh So how can we be so intimate with the Eucharist, not that God isn't completely and loving and wants to forgive those mothers and fathers who have killed their babies, but where is the the, uh, reformation and transformation going to begin for them? The Eucharist is he loves you, experiences love. You're being a Catholic, you're being, uh, if you say you're a Catholic, go to the source of what it is to be a Catholic, the Eucharist. Go there. He will transform your heart. The Sacred Heart loves you. Let him transform you. He loves you. And he is the only one who can reach into your heart. Now, the power of, of Jesus and his love for you as a Catholic, can radiate from the Eucharist. Go into the church, look at the tabernacle, find a place where the Eucharist is exposed, sit there and be baked and transformed. Hmm. I love that, be baked. (laughs) (laughs) Then imagine the kind of bread we can be. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I like toast. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not yeah, surprised? Yeah. Well, <laughs> have a great day, Monsignor. God bless. You've been listening to Building the Kingdom of Love Reflections with Monsignor John Essif. To hear and or to download this reflection along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for Building a Kingdom of Love, Reflections with Monsignor John Essef.